Um, okay, great. We're at uh, three minutes past the hour, so I'm going to kick things off. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us for our first uh, CLE of the new bar year. Um, we're joined by uh, Hill and Pham and uh, Michael Smith of Crow LP uh, to talk to us about how employees steal company data. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please uh, feel free to ask your questions uh, either in the chat or preferably using the Q&A function. Um, and if you could um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and or the Q&A at any time, but we will be answering them or asking our speakers to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, we can't put you, take you off mute, so please don't raise your hand during the Zoom because we can't take you off mute because there are too many people. Um, and I will put you the course number in the chat. If you have any problems, please feel free to chat us. Uh, and we hope you enjoy this presentation. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, my name is Haylin Fawn. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us today. Uh, we also have Michael Smith on, uh, my colleague. And Michael, if uh, you have the slide deck ready, we can go ahead and share screen, and we'll get uh, we'll get going with the presentation. So, everyone, uh, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll, we hope to share a lot of information for you. So, we'll go ahead and get started. The the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics recently released the, um, the April 2024 report that showed a 3.4% job turnover rate, which amounts to about 5.4 million jobs. So imagine how many of those employees handled client files, marketing data, or even in intellectual property. Now, imagine any number of those former employees leaving with that data in hand. So you get the idea. So Michael and I are here today to talk about how modern employees steal company data. Uh, our agenda for, uh, for today, we'll be, uh, we'll be going through uh, a number of topics. Uh, we'll also discuss a few case studies and we hope to, uh, to leave some time at the end for, for Q&A. So now a little bit about us. My name is Halen Fawn. I'm a, uh, I'm a principal in Crow's consulting practice, and I've been in the digital forensics and e-discovery industry for a little over 18 years now. Uh, during that time, I've worked on a, a variety of cases involving civil litigation, uh, intellectual, intellectual property theft, or IP theft, as we call it. Uh, and some criminal matters. I, I hope by sharing my experiences today that I'm able to offer some insight on how digital forensics can help companies with detecting data theft and taking the necessary steps to get the data back. Michael? Thank you, Halen. Well, my name is Michael Smith. I'm a consultant with Crow. I've been in the forensic industry for over 13 years. I perform numerous forensic investigations. I hold multiple digital forensic certifications. I have executed declarations, affidavits, and te testified as an expert witness. Uh, the digital forensic field is constantly growing and changing, and I really enjoy helping people understand more about it and helping them know what they we what we can show them and tell them from artifacts and data that we collect. So. This is a fun quote uh, to get us started. A computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any other invention in human history with the possible exception of handguns and tequila. I agree and think this is more apparent every day as technology, technology continues to improve and grow. So we're gonna start by taking a look at the previous company footprint. Uh, it used to be very simple. An employee would come into their office, sit at their computer, log on, and access the company servers. The servers were typically stored in-house or hosted just down the road at a facility. However, things have changed a lot in recent years. The modern-day company footprint uh, has a vast network of virtual and physical devices. Employees have computers, mobile devices, email accounts, and other cloud-based company resources. These resources can often be accessed remotely. Companies implement security features such as logging, VPNs, limited access to try to curb any, un any unauthorized access by employees. However, 
there's no such thing as a perfect security. Employees understand this technology better each year and are constantly learning the pitfalls. Halen? Thanks, Mark. Mark. Uh, employees, they, they do understand technology. They grew up with technology. And so they understand it better than previous decades of employees. You can see here the modes of copying or moving data. They, they not only require a few steps, a few easy steps, but the amounts of data that can be easily transferred has grown as well. Back in the, uh, the early 2000s, uh, recordable disk drives, those, those were awesome. Um, CD burners allowed us to burn CDs of music, media, and any other files. Uh, and at the time, CD burners were uh, initially pricey. Uh, buying the disk drive itself and also the blank disk, whether they were purchased in packs or in spindles, um, the uh, the cost itself was uh, always always apparent. Skip ahead uh, to uh, about a decade or so, then you have the USB hard drives and flash drives. What was once two gigabytes, eight gigabytes, or even 32 gigabytes of storage uh, is easily now one terabyte or more today. Um, and that storage is considered very low cost compared to what it was back then. And just about every computer has a USB port of some standard. Um, if uh, for those uh, who are familiar with the, uh, the types of USB connections, type A is probably the most popular and what we'll see that little rectangular connection on a lot of computers. Although we, uh, we are seeing type C, USB type C on many of today's computers and that has um, more advanced uh, capability because the data transfer rate has also advanced through the years, uh, allowing for larger amounts to transfer uh, fairly quickly. And so, but even with uh, the improvements in USB or any of these devices, does anyone even really need a physical device to copy or transfer files? Cloud accounts can be free. Uh, can, users can sign up for those free accounts with a small amount of storage. And then for a few bucks more a month, uh, they can get expanded storage. And so uh, with the onset of cloud accounts and mobile devices, uh, it's made our lives at home and the office more convenient but it's also opened many doors for exiting data as well. Today, company data can leave, it, it can leave by various means. Um, the slide here shows uh, some general statistics from, uh, from Crow's caseload uh, that make up how employees are leaving with company data. Uh, not a big surprise that uh, USB drives are the most popular. Uh, USB drives, they're relatively low cost for a large amount of storage. Um, they're portable uh, and they're easily hidden. Um, emails, second on the chart, very convenient. E uh, email is, is uh, very easy to use, um, but uh, the, uh, the limitations could be the attachment size, which uh, wouldn't allow for a, a transfer of large amount of data. The, the SMS messages from personal mobile devices and personal mobile devices, because they're not business, uh, are often tricky to collect and analyze. But through um, either agreed upon protocol, uh, protocols or uh, negotiations by all parties, um, we have managed to, uh, to collect uh, from mobile devices and do necessary searching and um, analysis in the past. Uh, as you look at some of the other categories here, you may wonder what uh, is in the other, uh, which is a small percentage. And the uh, the other category may uh, may include anything from um, printer uh, printouts or even just photos taken of screens or of data. So, so how do we? identify if uh, information or data has left the premises. Well, um, each act of data exfiltration or IP theft will have a source and a destination, to put it simply. Um, employees 
they're granted access to many sources uh, of data on their first day uh, of the job. Email accounts, network shares, SharePoint, those are, those are all prime examples of, of where the valuable information lies. And while user accounts can have restricted permissions uh, by the IT team or the security team, uh, sometimes requesting access to some of these off-limit sources may be as easy as providing a, a business case as part of the request. So while, while companies have contracts, agreements, procedures in place that, um, that define how, when, uh, and why employees are to handle the information, um, it seems those precautions, they're, they're quickly forgotten when uh, employees either find new jobs or uh, in some instances may be uh, released by the company. Uh, and during those times, time is short, uh, they move quickly and emotions may be high. So, But while the, uh, the company has many sources of data that are access controlled, we also see uh, Michael, next slide. We also see that destinations are really a different story. Um, and as far as the, the destinations of where data may end up, it's, it's easy for employees uh, to bring in a USB drive to uh, to log into a personal webmail or, or cloud account. These, um, these personal devices and accounts, they, they're not like business accounts. They have fewer security features. Uh, they're uh, a lot more basic. Companies, they can take measures uh, to preventing uh, usage of these accounts by disabling USB ports. Um, some companies, many companies are adopting that policy. Uh, IT team security may be blocking certain websites or, or URLs. Um, and those, those are some of the measures we see. Uh, they, they're, not, uh, they, they're not pertinent uh, to a lot of the companies. And it may depend on the size of the company and really how it affects the, uh, the workflow um, that IT or security may, uh, may decide to implement um, these measures. The, um, the destinations are very important uh, in any forensic analysis that, uh, that, uh, that we may take on. Um, providing enough evidence uh, to demand those personal devices for uh, collection, for imaging and analysis is part of our job. Um, so uh, the sources and destinations are very much the, uh, the entire picture that we want to, uh, to paint, uh, to, to put into view. Once the, because once the information exits the premises, um, it, it doesn't take long before the user for that uh, ex-employee has multiple copies, has backed up to a cloud account, and in some cases has viewed it or transferred it to their new employer's computer. Michael? Thanks, Halen. Uh, so let's take a look at how to investigate the data theft once it's reached its destination, as Halen had talked about. This is a general timeline of how an investigation will progress from the initial event all the way to the conclusion of the case, which typically ends in some type of remediation as to the, the intellectual property not being where it's supposed to. The event is the first red flag that is triggered that gives a client reason to suspect something isn't right. Uh, when this event takes place, the client may have an internal meeting to discuss what happened and whether they feel it is significant enough to launch an investigation. Many times this event is an employee that leaves a company and has a strong relationship with a high-valued client and when it goes to a competitor and potentially tries to take that high value client with them. Once the decision is made to investigate, uh, we then move on to scoping. Scoping is very important. This is where we can ask questions such as what was the employee's position? Did they have access to multiple devices? How in depth does the investigation need to be? Was the, was the employee working with 
others that may follow? Is the data we need even available or accessible? How difficult is it going to be to analyze or to access? You know, we really start asking the three whys. Uh, and then we move forward from there. Once we have a better understanding of the infrastructure surrounding the individual, we can start asking more questions related to the direct investigation. One key component that always comes up in, in almost every investigation is budget. You know, how much does a client want to spend on this case? Uh, how much can they afford? Uh, sometimes, is it even worth the investigation because of budgetary restraints? Uh, what is their ideal timeline for this investigation? You know, how soon do they need the information brought back to them? Generally, it's always ASAP, and we try to do that as best we can. However, sometimes there's a little leeway where we can balance caseloads and and kind of spread it out and do and give the results in a more timely manner so that everybody can ingest it as they receive it. Uh, a lot of times there's a lot of information that they receive and, and clients just have to take time to understand it. And we typically jump on a call and help explain that information. Um, what, would, what will they consider a successful investigation? Is this going to be a full litigation or is this going to be, okay, we know they took something, we'll be happy if they just delete it and never touch our data again. Uh, once we have a chance to iron out these details, we can move forward with the data collection. And the data collection, uh, during collections, we take into consideration the best methods to collect while maintaining the client's budget in mind. These collections are performed in the most efficient forensic manner available, which is always evolving and changing. What this means is that depending on the data source, we will be advised the best method to collect without disturbing any of the stored data or artifacts we analyze, while also trying to protect the client's own workload and their own timeline. Because we can't just stop business because somebody took something. We have to work around the client sometimes and around their hours of operation so that they can continue to bring in their revenue. Nowadays, it's much easier and cost efficient to perform remote collections than previous years. This eliminates unnecessary travel costs or additional billable hours by the examiner for traveling, wait time, uh, even on-site collection, on collection times. However, in some instances, good old-fashioned boots on the ground at the client site is needed and is preferred uh, just to have hands-on, to handle it and get it taken care of. Once that's wrapped up and the data gets back to our lab and checked in, uh, we move on to our analysis. The analysis is a key moment in the investigation. This is what will dictate the case and how it will move forward. Key analysis items are things like MAC times. Uh, these MAC times are a type of metadata that record when files were created, modified, and accessed in, in the data. And metadata itself is typically described as data about data. In more layman's terms, this is data that is stored internally that an end user doesn't normally see, but an examiner can take out and analyze. Again, like timestamps is one very key part of metadata. These timestamps will give us an idea of what was happening when the employee was preparing to leave, or even sometimes after they've left, but still had their work device. The timestamps will help us understand what was going on with that activity and help draw conclusions and connect dots. Uh, during the analysis, we dive into the user activity that was logged by the system and the patterns we see in the file activity. We look at USB device connections, recent file activity, email, internet history, cloud history, and many other artifacts. And this, again, allows us to connect these dots and pivot off of events as we see them take place in the analysis. We can pivot off such event, uh, pivot off events such as mentioned with the artifacts. There's also things like after hours log ons. Why was this person working a weekend? Why were they logged? This this guy, this person has been an eight to five kind of employee their whole tenure with the company. However, now they decide they want to work eight, nine o'clock at night, middle of the night to put in the extra hours. It seems odd. It seems off. Uh, that can be an event that we pivot off of. 
And then we look at Wi-Fi connections. Why is it connecting to a Starbucks all of a sudden? What are they trying to hide something, cover their tracks in some manner by using a public internet access? These are questions we'll, as an examiner, ask ourselves as we're doing our analysis. And it'll help us go down that rabbit hole and, and find the hidden pieces that just a normal glance won't show you. Software installations and usage, uh, key things like uh, anti-forensic software. Uh, C Cleaner is a big one. C Cleaner is one that we will see often on computers where they it forensically wipes data and this leaves bread comes breadcrumbs behind and allows us to try to determine what they were attempting to cover their cover up. These events should lead us to a detailed report, which will create from all of these different artifacts and findings and events. Uh, the report will be the end product of our investigation. It'll include a high level summary so that if you're in a rush, you don't necessarily have time to read all the details, but you want to know the hard hitting, the bulletin points, what happened, tell me quick. That'll be in the high level executive summary. Uh, after that, you'll see the more in-depth analysis. You'll see where we get more granular, where we talk about the artifact itself and what it showed us and what it tells us and what it implies or means. It will, uh, sometimes we can provide this report over the phone or over a screen share. If there's um, an issue with discovery and we don't want to send too many emails back and forth, we've worked with that before. We've provided a screen share or just communicated it over the phone, what we saw and what you should be concerned about, whether that's for your TRO or your TI or even to trial. Um, findings can be labeled as attorney-client privilege. We don't have to just send it to you as just a standard summary for anyone to see. Um, and this makes it easy for us to turn this into an affidavit or a declaration or even an expert report for later when you're ready to submit that to the court as your evidence and as your findings as the case progresses. After we've reached the report and we've concluded with our investigation, we get to a more overall conclusion to the case itself. Uh, remediation steps are key to that because we don't want the employee to have this data outside of their old employer with their new one, or even if they've started their own company, which we see too in, in many cases. Um, some remediations are very manual, such as webmail and cloud accounts. Uh, unfortunately, they've not automated that process where we can input a batch script or a list of emails or files on a web on the cloud account that we can just hit go, hit the go button. This is where an examiner like myself or one of my colleagues would go in and actually put eyes on the file or the email to remove it directly. Uh, we document this process. We uh, document that the trash can has been emptied on whatever platform was deleted. Uh, other computers, other devices like computers and external hard drives and USBs can be more automated depending on how they're set up. Uh, if if the system or the security allows, we can do a batch script, like I mentioned, where we can set up our, our forensic software, put all the list of files identified that the person should not have, and go ahead and hit the go button and just make it more simple. And then this outputs in a log that we can document that as well. Uh, that process is generally quicker and is always preferred because it saves budget time, right? Elon? Thanks, Michael. Artifacts, digital artifacts. I kind of like saying that word because it, it sounds so uh, legal at times, but uh, what digital artifacts, they're, they're what gets left when a, a user, say, double clicks a file where they empty the recycle bin or, or what we're talking about today, when they copy a file to another location. These artifacts, they're, they're valuable and they can get overwritten. They can get modified with each um, power cycle of the computer. Uh, 
or continued daily usage. So preserving the evidence, preserving the uh, the electronic evidence is as soon as possible is going to be key. Um, now, remember the artifacts for the collection of the artifacts themselves. Uh, it's uh, we it's helpful that um, we keep in mind they exist in both the source and the destination. Um, that's the that's the complete picture uh, that we want to um, see. Uh, that's the timeline that's going to include everything from shortly before departure uh, for leaving the company to um, what happens immediately after. And so uh, there can be multiple uh, places to look for this uh, this type of evidence, these artifacts. And the artifacts, they're, they're going to vary with the different sources. It's, it's not going to be uh, one size fits all, one procedure applies to everything. Uh, the, the laptops, even when we break it down, laptops, they're going to uh, be comprised of, are we talking about a Windows computer? Uh, we are seeing more uh, Mac OS computers these days. It's, um, it's been a trend that office environments are um, are allowing uh, different types of computers with different operating systems. And so uh, our analysis approach does, uh, does uh, change once that happens. Mobile devices. I, I, I know we traditionally see iPhones um, for at least the business environment, but uh, there have been uh, other types as uh, Android. Android comes in all makes and models, and there's going to be different versions of it across across the board. Um, but between all of these uh, these um, phones, tablets, these these mobile devices, uh, they are constantly evolving. Our tools have to keep up to to actually image and recover all these uh, these artifacts. Uh, servers. Um, we know that employees, uh, like I mentioned earlier, are, are basically granted access to some of these servers, these network shares upon their first day. And so um, knowing that uh, IT, IT groups, IT teams may be the key to us collecting and uh, reviewing some of these, uh, these logs or other, um, other artifacts uh, that may be found on the server are going to be uh, the, the cloud accounts, we touched on those, whether they're business, whether they are uh, personal accounts. Um, when you log in, you can see just about uh, different settings, depending on if it's a personal account, if it's a, if it's a business account, uh, checking the logs, the settings, the history, um, all very helpful information. Um, when it comes to uh, the sources, I, I um, spoke uh, spoke some to the, uh, the the actual computers. Sometimes the employees are uh, using or assigned more than than one laptop. We've seen that. We've uh, we've seen multiple laptops. We've seen uh, a laptop and a desktop computer. the uh, The number of devices that an employee may use uh, during their time with the company has uh, we have seen patterns of. Uh, they may touch or log into a number of devices, uh, whether it be physical. Uh, they may be using a remote protocol to to access some computers, and so the uh, the number of devices, making sure that everything's accounted for, um, at least for the person's role or their time, is going to be important as well uh, to uh, to collect that data and of course see see all the artifacts. Um, the destination. Uh, from our analysis of these, at least company assets, uh, what they did uh, either in their last week, their last month, did they connect to USB? Did they log in? Uh, these are all actions that are going to leave some trail. Uh, they're going to leave uh, artifacts for us to collect and review. Sometimes, like Michael was saying, uh, there may be measures taken as to what can I do uh, to undo what I just did, and so uh, there may be some uh, some software tools uh, to try to uh, to conceal to uh, to uh, to override or wipe. But even then, uh, the usage of some of those applications will um, will leave some uh, some trail for us to uh, to analyze. But uh, when we uh, are able to collect. Uh, are able to identify sources. The idea, of course, will be to work 
with the lowest hanging fruit, work from the keyboard. Uh, if we have the, the actual computer, uh, we'll start there. Uh, we'll know that uh, from the computer, the employee logged into email, uh, logged into their um, OneDrive, uh, then started accessing, uh, navigating all these subfolders on their um, network, uh, on the, uh, the servers. And then from there, did they plug in a USB? Did they even plug in an SD card if the, uh, the computer still has those slots? These are all external, um, external sources that were not company devices. We're going to be something that we are going to be uh, interested in uh, to see exactly what happened. And so um, it could be as easy as uh, logging into the cloud, uh, cloud accounts, create a cloud account and log into it. Uh, from uh, multiple cloud accounts, if, if a user is logged into their business um, OneDrive, they can easily create a personal OneDrive. And guess what? You then have two windows of uh, two cloud accounts open on your computer. How easy would that be to transfer information? But uh, does that does that leave artifacts? Does that leave a trail? It uh, it can, uh, and we've often uh, in our collection analysis have found activity indicating so. So, uh, cloud logs can include references to the other devices that may have accessed it. It may not have been the business computer. It could have been their personal. It could have been a tablet. Calling on behalf of Molina Healthcare with an important health benefit. Oh, well, um, <laughs> uh, hopefully the uh, the health benefits are worth. But uh, no, uh, as I was saying, these cloud accounts can be accessed by phones, tablets, uh, other computers, and that can appear in the logs as well. So uh, these logs uh, help us review the trail uh, to identify. Uh, how far the company information uh, could potentially have propagated. Michael? Thanks, Alan. Um, so as a wise man once said, information is power. Uh, that white man was Dwight Schrute, for any office fans. Um, this information is, is important because it gives an employee that's left and gone to a competitor, an unfair advantage in business. They're able to cut their old employer's numbers or pricing or budget. They're able to understand it and attack in a very competitive market, almost in any any industry. I don't I don't know an industry really that isn't very competitive and everyone's looking for an edge. So when we say information is power, it, it really rings true when it comes to digital forensics. Uh, this also could be information about what the activity was, what artifacts that Halen was discussing um, were involved in the exit strategy of the employee. So things to remember before performing an investigation, uh, you know, you think that you have an investigation on your hands, you want to move forward with it. Uh, a couple, what we like to say is key things is, is keep in mind, artifacts don't last forever. Uh, many systems have a automated removal process. Um, even Windows, the computer you use at home, will update and remove things from its registry, which is a key aspect of our analysis. Registry logs, things like the USB device connections, which is always important. It has around a 30 day window in window, window in windows, where it will remove artifacts from that registry in order to stay efficient and to run at optimal performance, even though sometimes we feel like our computers don't do that. So keep that in mind. Uh, if the, the company or your client is using Windows based machines and this employee left and this machine has been running and on since they left, that may be something you don't want to, you don't want happening. You may want to talk, talk to your client and tell them to shut that machine down, help preserve any information on there. Um, and then once it's shut down, you know, don't restart it. Don't turn it on. Uh, we always try to advise from sending it to IT. Uh, and this is not a slighted IT. IT is generally very intelligent people. However, they just lack the knowledge of forensics. So they think that when they can create a normal backup, 
that that's acceptable in our industry. And it's really not. Unfortunately, um, digital forensics has developed its own manners to collect data so that it is defensible and protected in court. Uh, an opposing cannot argue that the data has changed by the methods we use. There's there's redundancies in place for this, and it can get more technical. And those are those are things we can discuss at a, at another time. However, IT doesn't understand that, and so you know I've experienced it where IT has tried to copy data to their network and say, "Hey, I put it all right here for you. You can go grab it." I have to tell them, "Well, thank you for that that um, offer, but you've essentially tampered with the data by doing that. Um, if the original still exists in its original place, we would like to collect it from there. That way we don't have any tampering of timestamps or other metadata. Uh, other good rules are don't try to self-collect. This comes along with <clears throat> its own risks and headaches, which kind of align with what I was discussing about with IT. When you try attempt to self-collect and you're not on top of the most recent forensic standards on collecting data, it may not be defensible. An expert, opposing expert may come in and pick you apart on that and say, well, you didn't perform this method and you didn't use this tool or you didn't uh, get this MD5 hash or anything, anything like that. So it's best to leave it to the forensic experts so that we can defend our own work. It's what you're what you're going to hire us to do. Right. It's what it's what we're there for. Uh, it, we You wouldn't expect us to get up there and practice law. Right. <laughs> so it's best for us to perform the collections. It's best for us to perform the investigation and to do the analysis. Uh, it's it's literally why we're here on a day-to-day -day basis to do this job. Um, you know, other things to keep in mind is don't, don't connect any external devices. This would go along with self-collection. This would also go along with any kind of backup or trying to copy data off. Um, we've also seen it where IT will repurpose the machine. Another reason why we want to try to avoid sending it to them, because sometimes this happens without IT's knowledge or without the company's knowledge that there's going to be an investigation, right? They don't know that the employee took their information. It's months later, they've hired a new employee and they've given the old laptop to them. Um, that's not best practice in IT. However, we see it and we do our best to work around that. There are some things we can address and then some things we'll just have to say, unfortunately, that's not there, whether it's because of the repurposing or because it just was on for too long and it it auto deleted that information. Um, we can still find good artifacts. It's not a it's not a oh, well, everything's gone type scenario. Uh, there is still plenty there to look at and to find because that especially if that user profile is still intact, the IT just created a new user and didn't delete the old one. Um, so generally where we kind of throw up our it's sorry, it's gone type flag is when the system's been forensically reset. And when I say forensically, I don't just mean they deleted some stuff and repurposed it. I mean that they actually went through and wiped the machine and then reinstalled Windows. And there's not much else we can tell you. Unfortunately, that rarely happens, but we do see it. And then it's it is one of those situations where like, unfortunately, because of these, what happened here, here, and here, there's no artifacts left to be looked at and we don't know what they did. Um, that's worst case scenario in most investigations uh, for both us and the client. We don't want to give that news. We don't like to give that news. We know it's not going to be well received and we know it's not what they're paying us to do. So um, those are some key potential investigations. Uh, I'm sorry, some key things to remember during a potential investigation. Uh, from here, we'll move forward to some case studies. Um, these are some examples we've seen, and we'll go through these. We've got about three. Uh, the first one, so we had a situation where the employee left a company. Uh, for obvious reasons, these company names are made up. Uh, bonus points if you get any of the references. I had a little fun with it. Uh, the Dropbox was a personal tier level account with single user that was being utilized by an entire company. This is a very not good practice. I know I said that poorly. However, just to emphasize how bad it was, I said it poorly. You don't want to have a single user account with a whole company. Basically, they mounted it so that it looked like a normal network share and everybody was in and out under the same username. 
Um, this makes it very difficult to prove who is uploading any documents. Uh, it's it difficult to prove a lot of activity. However, by utilizing the activity logs, the, the name of the desktop used and timeframes, uh, we were able to provide the attorneys enough information to help them make a strong case. Uh, we were able to put that user with fair certainty at that computer during that time frame and show that they were uploading and downloading data. And when I say that, I mean, this This was a weird situation where the, co the employee left to go to their competitor. They came back to the original company and then left again. But while they were back there, that's when they were uploading and downloading. They were actually planting documents on their old uh, to set them up. And they're the ones I believe that were actually initial, the, initiated the whole lawsuit. And there was a countersuit once we were able to make this determination that this employee planted information. Uh, they were not, they were, they were definitely trying to take down their old employee, in my opinion. Um, they were able to use a third party app. Now, iPhones themselves don't typically allow you to move data like a USB drive. It doesn't let you just copy and drag drop. You usually got to go through iTunes. And most of the data that you're able to import or export is media files, such as pictures and videos and music. I believe, I'm sure many of you have done this with your iPhone personally. However, there are third-party apps. In this instance, it was called Ibrary Link. When I did this analysis, I was able to see this in the USB history because the way that the program operated, when the iPhone was connected to the computer, this Ibrary Link program mounted uh, much like a normal USB device. You would see, you know, when you go into my computer, you see the C drive, any other drives you may have connected. And then there was this library link, uh, which allowed the user to transfer, view, and share documents, just like a normal external device. Uh, it's a neat tool if you want to do it in your personal. I wouldn't recommend it when you're trying to sabotage a company and go to a competitor. Of course, I wouldn't recommend that at all. So uh, the volume showed up as the volume named Cube, uh, and it had its own serial number. So again, much like a normal USB device, it was very... It was very good that we were able to find that. It helped show this nefarious activities that this person was doing and really helped build the case against them. And we'll move on to case study two, Halen. Thanks, Michael. Case study two, this one, this one was a doozy. Uh, we had a, a company contact us. They, um, they had a high level employee leave the company. It was... It wasn't immediate. It actually was planned and, and coordinated. So uh, the company understood that they were departing. However, uh, we were asked to go ahead and retrieve the uh, company assigned laptop uh, just for some uh, due diligence, pre, uh, uh, just t making sure it's, it's imaged and, and just make any uh, effort to, uh, to check activity before the other uh, person um, departed. There was a there was some level of uh, I guess social engineering social engineering involved here, uh, and the only way I can describe that if if you're familiar with um, being the target of a phony phone call, they're going to express urgency. They're going to to um, to, to just make it sound like an emergency. Uh, in some instance, the uh, the individual here uh, wanted this done quick wanted uh, the, the, the imaging and the analysis look, uh, did it, said nothing, nothing happened on the computers, it's, uh, it's just professional activities. Uh, if anything, uh, he retrieved his, um, his personal photos uh, and that was it. So uh, that was just the start. Um, we imaged the computer, we performed our analysis and it really grew from there. Uh, what started out as a uh, just a single USB hard drive that showed folders, files, just a, 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 a massive number of content. And it was it was a blend. It was a blend of personal content uh, and business content, but that's just it. Oftentimes when individuals want to um, say, uh, copy off or take their personal photos, personal 
or health information, um, they'll try to uh, make a bulk move, bulk copy, and, it, and go ahead and include uh, some other folders or files that may not be personal. And that is very much the case here. Uh, what we found was the uh, the hard drive uh, that uh, was used toward the, the the end of this this person's employment uh, had definitely been plugged into other devices. Uh, the uh, if there's one of the things that uh, that Michael had emphasized uh, this timeline the the metadata dates and times uh, we did see from the from the USB drive that wait a second uh, these artifacts here indicate this was definitely used well after. Uh, it was plugged into the uh, the company computer, and so from there the uh, the the list of uh, potential sources grew. Uh, you see the the bullets we were talking about uh, now other drives. We're talking about uh, a personal email account, which uh, we ended up uh, collecting and have and identifying a number of emails that uh, that were not only forwarded from his work account, but also had items saved to a personal computer. Um, Usually with email accounts, if anyone has, say, um, a Gmail account or uh, an Outlook email account, it will come with uh, a cloud account. And, and so it's, it's pretty convenient. Uh, but in this case, uh, with the, the webmail, webmail account, we knew there uh, was likely an associated cloud account, which was included in the collection analysis and ultimate, ultimately a remediation. Um, this individual, uh, did make use of anti-forensic software. Uh, another uh, probably sense of, of trying to express a sense of urgency, trying to get this thing wrapped up quickly. Um, but the, the forensic image, the artifacts recovered, did show some patterns that indicated uh, what was a commonly used, uh, commonly used um, application software uh, free, um, but it does leave, um, it does leave specific. Um, artifacts and trails for us to identify. So uh, what started out as just a preliminary, let's just check this, uh, this um, person's company assigned laptop did grow into a, a number of devices. And ultimately um, the person didn't get a quick, uh, quick turnaround, um, something taken care of uh, in just a, a few days, but this thing, this matter actually uh, took over a year uh, to resolve, um, which included the uh, the protocol that had to be drafted, the agreed upon protocol um, that covered all these sources. And so um, we adhered to the protocol and in doing so, we're able to ultimately identify a few more sources, but ensure that the company data that did exit on that USB drive was located in, in several destinations and remediated accordingly. This third, this third case study was a, it was an example of how, how it just kind of grows, uh, at least in terms of the individuals involved. The previous case study showed how the, the actual number of devices grew. Uh, this one involved a number, um, one particular individual uh, that uh, that left a company. Uh, our analysis of uh, of over over fifty devices, the uh, for not just the individual but for the team uh, that the individual worked on, included laptops, desktop computers. We even had some company issued um, phones that uh, that were uh, imaged and analyzed. Uh, ultimately, when it, uh, when it came down to um, the findings and at least looking at the email, uh, either discussions and even going to uh, some of the chat logs, uh, we were able to see that this was a very, uh, very much a coordinated effort uh, from this one uh, individual uh, who um, spoke with another, a number of employees that, uh, that were recruited away to a competing company. The, um, the emails, the discussions, uh, which were reviewed and these documents were um, ultimately produced, uh, found uh, what was, uh, I guess, a, a planned activity that 
spanned um, several months uh, leading to uh, a fairly long court trial. Uh, but ultimately the, um, the verdict was that this, uh, this uh, key individual uh, had uh, planned uh, and conspired uh, to, uh, to recruit the company's employees away and at the same time take some of the, um, the intellectual property, the trade secrets in starting up this new company. Uh, it was a large, uh, a large uh, penalty, a large verdict that ultimately came down. Um, but uh, what amounted to a fairly large uh, number of people, a large case uh, that we were able to uh, to, to to help um, identify some of the um, identify some of the activity and ultimately the the resolution. Some key takeaways that uh, Michael and I would, uh, would like uh, for, uh, to share with you. Uh, we covered a lot during this lunch hour. And so uh, just, to, just to note that um, really no, no matter which side, uh, whether, it's, whether this is in litigation, whether you are uh, part of uh, just a company doing due diligence or whether you're that, uh, that departing employee just uh, making sure they follow protocol. Uh, you should preserve early. You should preserve off. The uh, the worst that can happen is you preserve either devices or you you uh, you acquire forensic images and then you don't need them. But when you do need them, um, making sure the the process is defensible and holds up in court is very important. Um, Michael and I have stressed throughout uh, that not everything's going to be on on the laptop. It's it's the starting point. It makes sense to start with the device or devices that the uh, the uh, employee or ex-employee was using, but know that that's just the start. If in fact it does lead to USBs, cloud accounts, webmail accounts, um, that's uh, that's going to be uh, where all the activity is ultimately discovered. The uh, the computers. Uh, the applications, uh, log files. We talk about log files. We talk about all these different artifacts and and how they're they're going to be different from data source to data source. Uh, knowing the proper way to collect those, uh, forensically, legally, uh, knowing how to uh, parse out the information and understand it. Looking at a Windows computer is not going to be the same as looking at a a Mac computer. So uh, being aware of that and, and knowing uh, what artifacts. Uh, I've uh, I've mentioned a few times about these agreed upon forensic protocols. These joint protocols, they are valuable. Um, they may take a little time in drafting. They may take some time in getting the uh, the language and the wording just right. But ultimately, once it's signed off, and um, and forensic uh, or digital forensic vendors like us would uh, have to follow and adhere to to make sure that. Um, that the process, uh, the process ensures a timely, uh, cost-effective method of data collection, analysis, um, return of information, uh, remediate uh, sources. Uh, that is uh, going to be um, very important in the, the entire process. Michael, the, the other items uh, you may have some, some information on as well for the remainder of this. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Companies and individuals aren't in the business of litigating. Let's keep that in mind, right? Uh, they want to get this done. They want their data protected. They want it removed from any locations it may be. And they want to get on back to making widgets and making money and revenue uh, like everyone else, right? So we kind of keep that in mind when we're doing our analysis and we're going through all this, this whole ordeal so that we can get them back to what they know and what they want to do. Build their business. Grow their company. Uh, with that in mind, we go into these settle, settlement agreements and try to assist with all the what ifs. Uh, what if it made it to this device or this location? What if they had it here or there? We try to cover all those bases. And when you when you're going through it with your client, you 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 may want to reach out to us and help us allow us to help you find all those what ifs, especially when it comes to the digital side of it. So we want that agreement to be well written thought out and cover all your bases. Uh, personal devices and cloud accounts are the new gateway of stolen company. People nowadays 
think that they that they can use their personal devices. I mean, they still think this that they can use their personal devices and cloud accounts to put company data because it's theirs. They own it to a degree. They're right. Yes, you own that account. Yes, we are not allowed to access that account without permission or a court order. However, once you get into this to this situation where there's litigation pending and you're going through these depositions and talking about all the places you may have the company data, well, now that becomes discoverable. Now we get the court order that we need and the permission we need to go in, collect your personal devices, collect your personal cloud accounts, find what we need to find and remove it or produce it to how, whatever the circumstances may be. Uh, I, in my personal life, I tell people all the time, do not mix your personal and your business. It, it it won't your privacy won't be protected if it gets in a situation where there's a court order. You 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 cross the line that you can't come back from at that point. And so we try to just let people know. And granted, we do protect their privacy when we collect their data. We we're not going to collect their data and just produce everything to the court saying here's everything, including their family pictures. No, it's irrelevant. We don't want that. We don't care about that. Here are the facts. Let's stick to what's important, the company data itself. And that's what we try to reassure, even, even if they're opposing and, and they're grumpy, we try to reassure them so that they are a little, you know, take their medicine a little better. We let them know that their, their information is protected in our lab behind key card access, security, all sorts of encryption and different, different security implementations to prevent anyone unauthorized seeing their personal information that doesn't need to be produced. So with all that in mind, we go into the questions or comments section. We have a, a few minutes left. We can address anything um, that you guys may have that you, you thought about during this presentation that you'd like to ask. Do we have any in the chat? Uh, not yet, but I will encourage people to either drop them in the chat or the Q&A, whichever is, is easier. And I'd also like to say no question is a silly question, so. <laughs> well, if there are any questions, um, thanks uh, thanks for having us here today. Uh, we uh, we really enjoyed sharing our experiences. And if uh, if anything does come up in the future, whether it's a question or need some more information, uh, Michael and I will uh, gladly help out. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your coming and speaking to Hyla today. Um, if no one has any questions, uh, we will uh, let you guys go. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Please remember to self-report your CLE, and we'll see you next month.